You know, the thing about Facebook Live is it's a lovely, lovely way for us to connect uh, with our customers and our potential customers, quilters all over the world. Um, but one of the things is, is that it is a relatively technical thing for us to do. Um, and on a Saturday morning, uh, I need to have at least a second cup of coffee um, in order for me to be um, thinking nice and clear. Um, I don't know if you're the same, but anyway, hopefully I'll get a coffee in a second. Welcome to Facebook Live. Uh, it's Pete and myself, Liz, from Pinnell Quilting, and we're going to talk with you today about some of the most important elements of our quilting, long arm quilting machines, which is in essence the, um, the bobbin, the bobbin case, and the hook assembly. So these are the things that are going to make a huge difference in terms of the quality of your final output from your machines. So that's the, the elements that we're going to discuss today. So we hope we, that you find it useful. If you're a new customer um, or you're looking at long arm machines, you'll learn more about bobbin cases with our, when you get a long arm machine than you probably will have done if you've got a domestic. So um, I'm just going to see, make sure. Let's have a look at the live video. And I'll just refresh my feed. So I love it if I can actually see um, what's happening on our live feed. So I've got a big screen TV over there and uh, all it keeps doing is going to the, uh, why can't I see a video on Facebook? So that's not very helpful. Okay, um, the elements of the bobbin case and the bobbin that are most important is really the integrity of those components. So, you know, we don't recommend just getting any old M-class bobbin um, for your machine. And I'm just gonna welcome people to the group because Pete's gonna tell me who's coming online. We've and got if... lots of people already. We've got Roz and- we Hi, Roz. You've Helen, just... Val Brooks, morning. Good morning, Val. And Laurel, hello, Laurel. You're very, uh, you're on seeing us every week, I think. Yeah, and fantastic. Mare, still waiting patiently, Mayor. <laughs> and Lynn and Leanne. Derek, morning again, Derek, from a snowy Northern Ireland. Wow, there's and... so much snow around at the moment. And we've got Carol Beely, Jane Morley, Liz Great, Allen, Jane. And possibly, Liz. possibly Brian as well. Liz and Brian. Up in Scotland, I bet you've got a bit of snow up there. Um, and Moody, Diane Bell, morning everybody, morning. Lots and lots and lots of people already. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, a lot of you who are online at the moment, you've already got your long arms. There'll be some names that we don't recognize, obviously. But the lovely thing is, is that when, you know, with the long arms, we tend to sort of have good relationship with our customers that we get to know you, which is, which is really lovely. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to mention today, today is the 13th of February, the day before Valentine's Day. And what does that mean? That means it's my mum's birthday. And um, so happy birthday to my mum. My mum set up the cotton patch in uh, 1990. And uh, she, she classically said to my dad, am I too old to start a business? And she was older than, than I am now when she set up the cotton patch. Um, so that was 31 years ago. And I, I remember, because I was around, I was in between jobs, I was just about to restart at IBM at the time, and I had a month free. So I helped them set up the computer systems and um, some of the admin side of things at the cotton patch. And um, I posted on my Facebook page today a picture of my mum by a till um, in the new cotton patch shop where they still are. Um, so my mum and dad were still working up till um, the whole lockdown thing with COVID last year. And today she is 89. So happy birthday to Jean Sewell, who is 89 today. We'll do a bigger celebration next year. That's a very, very big one. The thing about um, making quilts and um, the whole quilting community in a way is that it's a very connected one as well. So last, yesterday I was uh, doing some looking online I was looking at the Mancuso World Quilt Show, which some of our customers have entered their, their quilts into. And I noticed that they'd posted uh, yesterday 
that a lady called Roberta Horton had passed away. And I, I put a little post on our Facebook page for those of you who've seen it. Um, Roberta Horton was a really important figure in the quilting community in the 1990s. And she used to teach at a quilt shop over in California. And this quilt shop in California, uh, they had Roberta doing a lot of classes. And between the owner, Carol, and Roberta, they decided that they had enough content to make a book. And the book, um, one of her first books, Plaids and Stripes, was, was really about using more difficult fabrics. And she also wrote another book called The Fabric Makes the Quilt, which is what I have here, the copy here. And Roberta was, was quite a, um, I suppose, a, she put fabric combinations together that a bit more edgy. She came from a background of a lot more traveling than, than a lot of, um, traditionally, a lot of people would have done at the time. And so she integrated a lot of her traveling information and fabrics that she acquired along the way. So that would be places like Japan and Africa. So she has some really interesting prints and she sort of made people look outside the box. So she did this book with Carol and Carol said to her husband, you know, it'd be really good to publish this book of Roberta's that we, we would, you know, that we'd like to put together um, for the classes. And so Tom did some research. He was an, I think he was an engineer. And so he did some research and he worked out he, how to publish a book, which back in the, not back in the sort of, I think, 80s or not early 90s, was not something commonly done by your average punter, you know. Um, anyway, they put it together and they published it. And that is how C&T Publishing started. So C&T is a very big publisher in the quilting world. And the people that started it were Carol and Tom. Carol and Tom from the Cotton Patch in California. So this story, the reason I know this whole story is because my mum, my dad, my brother and I were at Houston um, back in like nine, late 90s or something. And if any of you have ever been to Houston, Houston is huge. It's absolutely vast. And, you know, when things open up, up again and you can go, a trip to the Houston Quilt Festival is a definite on your bucket list. Well, we would go as the suppliers the week before to Quilt Market. And they have this enormous area with all these concessions around it with huge banqueting tables that take like 15 people at a time. And we sat down with our um, pulled pork, whatever it was, and we sat down and we looked across the table to these people. And we'd got our badges on, Jean, Jeff, Liz, Cotton Patch. And I looked across the table and there was the Cotton Patch. So we got chatting and we got, we got to know Carol and Tom. And when Carol came over to the UK a few years later, she came and visited the Cotton Patch. Um, and, you know, it was such a lovely thing to do. And I met Roberta at a class and this was the quilt. It seems so appropriate. There is my little heart quilt I did with Roberta Horton, who sadly passed away this week. So condolences to Roberta and her family. Obviously, she will be sorely missed, um, particularly from her sister, Mary Mashuta, as well, I'm sure. So there we go. That is our little heart quilt that I did using challenging fabrics, lots of stri stripes and plaids and things, which at the time kind of threw people, but we, we used to do a lot of those plaids and stripes back in the day. So that's my little story about CNT uh, publishing. I thought it was quite an interesting way of the fact that we all you know, we're all connected in some way and it's been a lovely community to be part of. Let's go back on, oh look, coffee's arrived. That's lovely, thank you very much, Pete. Any any comments so far or any questions that people no have specifically? No, a few people looking forward to it. Okay, I love it if I could get up the, I'm just trying to. Try to see if I can sort that. Yeah, that would be great. You can just take it over there. It's connected to that, but you can see that it's not actually playing on there. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, you need to cast that tab. That's what it is. I've changed the tab. Let's look at bobbins. Bobbins, the fundamental thing of our bobbin tension dictates how our stitches form. And the way that we do stitches and that we set our tension on a long arm is we set our bobbin tension and then we set our top tension. Once we've set our bobbin tension, we generally, 99.9% .9 of the time, don't have to touch the bobbin again because we have a procedure, a methodology for setting the bobbin tension. And that is to do what's called the drop test. So 
Because of that, it's really important that our bobbins are consistently wound. They're not spongy. You don't find that they've sort of wound and then just kind of keep coming unwound. And there are a variety of bobbins available. I've got a selection here just to run through with you today. The standard bobbins that used to come with the handy quilter did not have a hole in them. Um, so I'm just going to... Oh, yeah, you need to turn the sound off. There we go. That one, no hole. Any any comments so far? Do you want to... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay, if you cast that tab, that'd be great. Sorry about this. It's amazing how just trying to get the Facebook up is actually quite hard on my laptop at the moment. This is the standard one that now comes. It's got a little slot in it, and that makes it easier to take up the excess thread when you put, first put it onto the bobbin wind, winder. And Handy Quilter came out with some absolutely lush purple bobbins. Purple bobbins, 30 purple bobbins in a lovely bobbin box. And I know a certain person in Cambridgeshire has just rece taken receipt of that. So that is fabulous. Ah, thank you. I've just seen that um, Pete has finally managed to get our feed up and it's absolutely brilliant because now I can actually see what, what's happening. And welcome to everybody. And I noticed that, um, that Stuart Hillard's here and yeah, the story about Roberta and C&T. Glad you like that one. Um, it's lovely, isn't it, that we meet all these people and we've seen you over in Houston as well. And, you know, it opens up a whole new world of the quilting community when you go over to Houston. So the Handy Quilter Bobbins, they come in a packet of eight like this or the big pack of the 30 purple bobbins. I mean, it is mm, eye candy for quilters, eye candy for quilters. We've also got the opportunity to use, we can wind our own using these and we've got our bobbin winder over here. But there are on the market various pre-wounds. Let's just run through what we've got because we've got few different places that we would um, use these because of the thread weight that is pre-wound onto them. We've got ones from Wonderful, and we normally include a sample of these in our new machines. Um, this is a plastic disposable, chuck it away at the end, sadly, um, pre-wound, which is pre-wound with an 80 weight Deco Bob. It's a lovely fine polyester thread and it's a fine filament and it quilts beautifully. It has a really lovely quilted effect on the back because you don't really see the, the stitches so much. You just see the quilting and it's all about texture. Um, and of course, you know, depending on what thread you're using and what fabric you're using on the back, you can get that to contrast or to blend in with your backing fabric. Deco Bob comes in either a single pack of 24 bobbins and uh, they're the same color. On each one, you've got just under 200 meters, uh, or you can get these mixed packs. There's four different colors in here, and you get uh, two, four, six of each of those. And we've put together for this handy for this Facebook Live a lovely set in a handy quilter bobbin box of a selection of the deco bobs that you might like to try. Where we've put together three of each in a selection of quite of most popular sort of colors. So we've got a, a, a mid gray, we've got a cream in there, but we've got the pink for your um, baby quilts. And there's a navy. You might not want 24 navy. Um, so we've put three of those in there and there's a total of 10 different colors in the box. And we've got 20% off that and it's on our website. And if we run out, then let us know that you would like some because we can, we can get some more in. So yeah, hi Mike, Mike over in Lincolnshire and Jane, yeah. Oh yeah, you see Jane and Stuart know each other because they were both on the Great British Sewing Bee. So um, brilliant, I love it, I love it. This kind of the whole community thing and people knowing each other and how they've met and absolutely brilliant. So Jane and Stuart reconnected on Facebook on a regular basis. So the other uh, pre-wounds that we can talk about that we've got available. Glide is a really popular thread. Um, we've got our Glide, Glide Thread Club, which is the, the packs of nine different Glide uh, threads, and they come together in coordinated sets that Pete and I have put together, been really, really popular. But you can also get Glide for your bobbin. And the way that Glide, the company that make the Glide thread, do their bobbins is they put a little magnet on. 
And the point of this, and I'm just going to digress now because there's, um, there's a little video that Pete's put together that you can find on our blog, which tells you all about backlash springs and why they are on our bobbin cases. But in brief, inside the M size bobbin case is a spring. It used to be just a simple U shape. Okay, hopefully you can see that. And it's now got a little spring in it that is more like um, a sprung steel. And the reason for it is, imagine that you're particularly when you're on a stand up movable long arm, you're going along very, very quickly and you come to a sudden stop and the net result is the bobbin keeps rotating and you get a different tension on the bobbin. So that is why we have a backlash spring. It puts pressure onto the bobbin when it's in the bobbin case assembly. So if I just put one of these in here. <clears throat> so this, it puts pressure on it and it means that that now has, is held much more carefully in place so that when there's a tendency for it to overspin, it can't. So backlash spring, very, very important. And the video that Pete's put together tells you more about it and what happens about replacing it back in your bobbin case if it should unfortunately spring out unintentionally. When you're cleaning your bobbin case, it's not a bad idea to every now and then just pop it out with a screwdriver and you can easily put it back in. If it becomes damaged in any way, you get maybe a bit of thread around it and you, it gets tugged or distorted, uh, we have spares of these. So that's not a problem. So the idea of these with the magnet on is to do an alternative method for reducing the problems of backlash with this varying tension as a result of overspinning. The magnet keeps a consistent tension and we set the bobbin case tension slightly differently as a result. So this one, for example, is a filament polyester 60 weight. It's called, it's a magnet -like classic and this filament is beautifully fine and it works really well. So if I just get one of those out, I've got one here. So if I pop this in this bobbin case and Pete, I don't know whether you could do a close up on this because it would be quite useful to have people able to see what's going on here. So here's our bobbin case. For those of you who aren't familiar with the bobbin case on the, uh, handy quilters. This is an M size bobbin. It's big. It's amazing how when you go back to a domestic, you think, what? How little thread can I get on here? So you see, we, we put it in with the magnet on the inside of the bobbin case. There's the magnet. And that goes in like so. There's the inside with the backlash spring. You do not remove the backlash spring on handy quilter machines to ignore what uh, Filtech, Mag uh, the people who make glides say, do not remove the spring. I'll say it one more time. Do not remove the spring. It's, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Thank you, Pete. Um, Roz, Roz has asked if we can post a photo later of the inside of the bobbin case and the backlash spring. What I think we'll do, Roz, is we'll post a link to the little video that I did. It's only a short video, it's on blog. which explains the whole thing. Yeah. I'll just explain because Pete, I just did this yesterday. There's a blog post. Our latest blog post is, has actually got lots of photos of the close-ups of what I'm going to explain today, plus a link to Pete's video, plus a link to the maintenance video that I put together a few months ago. So everything is in one place. So if you go to pinallquilting.co.uk, go to the blog, click on there. The latest one is that blog post. So what we do with this is instead of it being a drop test, which most of you who've um, got a handy quilter will be familiar with, and the drop test involves putting your bobbin in the bobbin case. Uh, it goes clockwise, clockwise, goes in like this. And then I put it in the palm of my hand and I basically just let it pull up. That's slightly tighter than I would normally have it. I just want it to drop really easily and it's tiny little incremental changes. So I've just changed it by two minutes of the clock face. And there we go. That is that is pretty loose, so slightly too loose. So just put it back, fraction. And don't rewind the thread. For those of you who hate wasting thread, you'll be going, no, no, no. But you can actually keep that thread and then use it in a project that I'm gonna show you. We can actually use some of these things and bits of thread. I'm gonna do that on another Facebook Live. That is Bob Intention. 
beautiful, beautiful. Compared to the magnet, the magnet is holding on to the tension. So that is just too tight. But I'm going to use it like a bit like a yo-yo. So I'm going to just have it so that it drops down. And what I'm looking for, it's actually more like the feel of it, so that it feels like it's going to pull and just drop. It's still not quite enough. So I'm going to change it by another couple of minutes of a clock face. Actually, I'll just take this out again. If it doesn't feel quite right, make sure that it's actually in the bobbin case correctly. Particularly if you're doing a live Facebook. <laughs> what I don't want to have is be unloosening it so much that the screw falls out, which has happened for people who've got the Magna. I'm just going to do this in a different one. Hang on. Right, so there's my thread coming off clockwise. Pop it in the bobbin case under the spring. It's a little bit more. Probably had like 100 weight in here before or something. That's better. Now that's dropping down. As I, dr as I drop it, it is flowing through the spring. And then you can see it's like a yo-yo. Now that's how I set it. There's actually, if you use this glide thread and with glide on the top, there is quite a lot of, of flexibility with how it's set. This thread is really forgiving, but that is the best way to have your bobbin thread. It's just so that it's, it's sort of just going down like a yo-yo when I put some pressure on it, like that. Okay, question from Val, Liz. Does the bobbin, yep. does the bobbin tension change as the thread runs down on the bobbin? You know, some people do notice that, other people don't. Um, we could have a discussion about it on our long arm learning curve, and it would be quite nice to get a poll of how many people change it. I, th I think there's a few of our customers who, as, as they know the bobbin is running out, will slightly tweak it. Uh, personally, I, I tend to use, I'll be honest, I tend to use the Magna, and therefore I don't have to do that. If I were using something that actually had a lot of weight to it, so a heavy weight thread, it might be quite a dense thread. I don't know if that makes much of a difference um, between the start and the end point. That might make a difference. Say it's got a high metal content in it. There's one that I've got here that's hand wound with a metallic thread. Um, I mean, maybe that would be would be more um, heavy. Would be, would be more heavy, would be heavier at the beginning and therefore I might need to adjust it. Let's do a poll, Val. That's a great question. I know my experience, but I can't speak for everybody. So going back to our Magna. Magna Glide Classic, though. That's, that's a, a fine filament, 60 weight. We've also got Magna Soft. Magna Soft is a lovely, lovely thread. It grabs the glide the shiny glide uh, thread, if you're using that on the top, it's a really good combo with glide. So glide 40 on the top or glide 60 on the top, Magna Soft in the bobbin, pre-wound, absolutely fabulous. And I thank Kimmy Bruner for that one because she was the one who first said, like, get seven or eight threads of, of um, colors of Magna Soft for your pre-wound bobbins, and then they match with 90% of the threads you're ever going to use on your top as a glide thread. And she's absolutely right. So we've got a selection of those um, and they really work well with glide. That slickness of glide, if you use glide on the bottom, sometimes people find those two slick threads do not sort of hold well together. But it's a bit like if you're used to using um, embroidery thread that's quite slick, you'll find that the machine manufacturers and the embroidery thread manufacturers tend to have like a bobbin fill that's quite hairy. So there's a little bit of hairiness to this Magna Soft and it, it really does work. So that one, definitely worth a try. Here we've got the paper-sided bottom line. Superior threads, call these super bobs. I think they might be changing to plastic. I did hear on the grapevine that they might be changing to plastic. With these, this cardboard outer can become damaged and sort of jam against that backlash spring, in which case, just take it off. 
just take it off, remove it, and remove it from one or both sides. Remove it from the first side. Um, the one you would remove first is the one that goes inside the bobbin case. All right, so that's Super Bobs. They have 60 weight bottom line pre-wounds. Pre so those cardboard outers can just pop off. One thing I'd like to mention about winding your bobbins is Handy Quilter recommends no more than 80% fill on their bobbins. And these bobbins are made from aluminium, which is a relatively soft material. And therein lies the issue. If we wind them too much, the outsides of the bobbin splay and then you find that your bobbin does not fit securely within the surrounds of the bobbin case. Now, this did happen to one of our educators. She'll remember this um, if she's watching. And what happened was it was an old bobbin, nothing, nothing wrong with the machine at all, but actually it simulated an issue with the machine. And um, what's, what's interesting is it was just that this outer of the bobbin had actually splayed and was jamming intermittently when it was rotating within the bobbin case. So that is something to look out for. There, you will get some distortion where the, the middle spindle section of the bobbin is uh, manufactured uh, but that should generally be pretty flat. And the key thing is if I put it in one of my bobbin cases with the backlash spring in it, you will see that the spring pushes the bobbin out, but it always goes back. And that's a check for you to do to make sure that that is not sitting proud, or the edges of it are not sitting proud like so, you should be able to push it down. When it engages in the hook assembly, you're gonna find that that is down below the edge of the bobbin case. Turn it so that it's angled towards the camera, so the edge is angled, yeah. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, a couple of people saying that occasionally they need to tweak the bobbin tension as the bobbin winds down, which is logical because the weight of the thread makes a difference. Um, uh, Leslie's asking, presumably Magnasoft bobbins are set the same way as Magnaglide. Yes, they are. Exactly the same. Correct. How often do you need to replace the bobbin holder? The bobbin holder, the bobbin case. Yeah, I understand the bobbin needs to have a bit of a spring. Well, actually that's probably um, you can replace the spring itself Joyce if it mm. gets uh, if it gets flattened too much your dealer should be able to provide one of those if necessary but uh, have a look at my video because there are different types of spring different types of bobbin case you need to get the right one on the blog post I, I talked briefly about that so the the ones that we've got that we generally replace the bobbin cases with are the Cerniani it's an Italian manufacturer and the one, the alternative is this one, which is made by a company in Japan called Koban. Uh, the springs are slightly different. And as Pete said, on his video, he explains the difference. And the old style Serliani had like a simple U shape on it. It's like metal colored inside, as opposed to a blue black sprung steel, uh, which is on the newer one. We also wanted to mention that and actually, this did come up in a conversation with a customer not that long ago who got a problem with her tension, and it was driving her to distraction. Um, it was a real, it's a real pain, isn't it? You know, you've got a customer quilt with all of that pressure of getting it absolutely beautiful. And the last thing you need is a problem with your tension. So we recommend, if you'd, certainly if you're doing it as a business, get a second bobbin case. And if you're using Magna, set one for Magna and one for your regular threads, uh, for regular bobbins. And by having that second bobbin case, you're, it's a bit of an insurance policy. We, um, you know, th there is nothing worse, and this will happen because this is what life does. It'll be a Friday evening and you drop your bobbin case, knock it out of whack, 
and it won't go in properly and it won't sew properly and you need to replace it because you've got a tile floor and like the butter side on the toast, it will always land on the floor. It probably landed on that open bit of the bobbin case and it's just distorted it. And it's Friday, uh, it's bank holiday. So, you know, you've got absolutely no chance of finishing the quilt that you want to gift to your whoever on Sunday because that's what we do. So having a second bobbin case, great idea. It's gonna save you all of that stress. Particularly if you quilt for others. If you quilt for others. A couple of questions. Claire, yeah. I'm not sure what question you're asking there, Claire, uh, because okay. I didn't see the point at which your comment came in. So Claire's question was, what problems does it cause, Liz? But I don't know what you were talking about at the time. Oh, okay. It might, was it, would it have been the distortion of the bobbin? It would be the ah. irregular sewing. So your tension would be okay, then it would jam, and you'd get like tight bobbin. Basically, if it jams, suddenly you're gonna get the bobbin t uh, thread going extremely strong tension. That's gonna pull the top thread down and you're gonna get a straight line of bobbin thread without it looking like it's sewing properly. And it's gonna pull down the top thread. It's gonna look like the top thread tension might be an issue, but it's not. It's actually the bobbin tension. Um, it's, a real, it's a really difficult one to diagnose. Um, I mean, I, you know, we nearly got to the point of replacing the hook assembly because it looked like that was the issue. And the hook assemblies go on and on and on and on and on um, for a long, long time if you look after them. So let's just talk about other things that we can do. We've got a bobbin winder for our machines. So every new, every new handy quilter comes with a bobbin winder. It's a lovely little unit. Here it is. This is our bobbin winder. It's not on the machine, which is great because it means that we can just keep it separate. And it has an auto shut off that we normally, if we're setting up for it for you, we set this up. But I've got a really nice little video, she says modestly. I have a video which shows you how to use the bobbin winder and it talks about adjusting this, this, adjust this, forward, back, so that your bobbin is wound evenly, does not cone, is not spongy, and shuts off at 80%. So that's that, spongy bobbin. When you're starting to wind a new bobbin, thumbnail in the bobbin and just check if you can get your thumbnail in it and it feels spongy, you may need to rewind it. And I, what I would suggest that you do in that case is get a plastic beaker, pop the old one in the beaker, put a new bobbin on your bobbin winder and rewind the, the uh, faulty one onto a new bobbin. Okay, a few questions in this. So first okay. of all, Rona's asking, I've no idea about this, Rona, you have a box of unmarked pre-wounds. How do you identify what they are? I haven't the faintest <laughs> idea. <laughs> oh, send us a picture, we'll I've, probably know. <laughs> That's the tricky one. There's a lesson there for everybody else. <laughs> Make a note. <laughs> John, morning John, John Cole Morgan's with us. Mm. He's saying that uh, keeping a spare bobbin case or two is really good advice. So that's good. Good, good, good. Uh, Mike, will a new type spring fit an old type bobbin case? No, it won't because the way the spring fits inside is completely different. With the old yep. style, the spring is held in place by a tiny little screw. The new ones are held in place by little lugs within the bobbin case itself, which don't exist on the old style bobbin case. So no, it won't. Um, that's right. Yeah, so will the cases on my two machines be interchangeable? Yes. The faff is Japanese. Uh, yeah, if it's an M-class bobbin case, they will be yeah. interchangeable completely. Yep. Yes, Helen, definitely. Yep. Oh, is that Helen Burnham? That's Helen Burnham. Yes, yes so, it will. So with your new Moxie and your faff, Your new Moxie. <laughs> uh, they are interchangeable completely. Yep. Um, Derek says that uh, Jamie Wallen sells a bobbin case de-warper. He does, he does. Yes. We're looking at possibly getting some of those made here as well. Yeah, getting something machined. Okay. Anything else? No. Nope, okay, brilliant. Now. So the other thing I wanted to mention on bobbins and winding bobbins, or two things actually. Uh, number one, say I want to do some quilting in reverse. I want to use some unusual thread on the reverse. And something like this is, it's a wonder fill. Um, actually, no, it's not. It's Superior Threads Razzle Dazzle, Ricky Tim's Razzle Dazzle. And it's got metallic bits in it. 
That can, you might be able to do it on your bobbin winder. You'd have to slacken off the tension assembly, but you can just hand wind something like this on the bobbin and just go and you're done. And the other thing is, and you can put this underneath the spring. Obviously you'll have to loosen off the tension, but it will be adjustable just like a normal bobbin. So I will let that go off, slacken it off a bit more, and there we go. That might be enough. I'd have to, I'd be mindful of what I've got on my top thread as to how much I slacken that off. If I was using a very strong thread on the top, I wouldn't be worried about it being a little tighter. Um, but that actually, if you look at that, there we go, it's just dropping. And I just wiggle it slightly. So I have that set maybe a little tighter than the other ones. Now, the next thing to say is also, you will have noticed, compared to your domestic machine, you will have noticed that on the bobbin case is a hole. So this here at the top, this bit here, that means if you were to use very, very thick thread, silk ribbon, something else like that, a bit more bulky, pearl cotton, for example, that you've hand wound, instead of putting it through the slot and under the spring, you can just have it coming out of there. So for the really innovative thread play machine embroiderers among you, that might be something that you want to try. Okay, a couple of other things. Okay, this is good. These are some good questions. So, Jenny, ah, Jenny, that's a that's an unrelated question. How is the weather in Salt Lake City? Well, actually, Jenny, it's now a case of what the weather is like in Atlanta, <laughs> which is where the shipments currently oh. held up. <laughs> but we're working on it. Oh. We're working on it. Can you tell we're a bit frustrated? Yes. Oh. Um, John John Cole Morgan saying he bought three yep. bobbin case holders, put different bobbins in each box, and put a label at the base of the bobbin cases to identify them. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah. Your bobbins. Lindy asks, I yep. want to use two glide threads in the top. Will this have an impact on the bobbin tension? No. Same bobbin tension as always, Lindy. Just yep. the same. Good question. And uh, good morning, Wayner from Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. You're a bit late, Wayner. It's late. It's early. <laughs> a bit late. <laughs> That's not what she says. <laughs> I'm late. No, you're not. You must be early over there. It must be really, really early in the morning. And um, question from Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, uh, Lorraine. For Hi. Bo for bobbins which haven't wound correctly, it says to rewind. Can that be done on the bobbin winder? Yes. So I, I, you might have missed it. What I, what I would suggest is, say I've got this thread here, which is a pink glide thread. Um, if that's a 60 weight, if it were too spongy and I was worried about the tension on it creating a problem, what I would do is I'd put that in a beaker. Uh, I tend to put it in a pit beaker because it's softer for the aluminium to bash around because it sort of goes around quite a lot. Put it in your beaker, just put your hand over the top and have it come from the back of the bobbin winder. There we go. wonder if you can see me there. Maybe you can just tilt that down. Can you see on that camera piece? This is this. Let's oh, tilt it. Yeah. That's great, thank you. So instead of pulling up from here, I would just take this off and I would put my beaker at the back and I would have it coming up from the beaker, from the bobbin and around there to my new bobbin that's empty and I would put my hand over that beaker just to stop that coming out because it'll be like that. Well, that's sort of, it won't make that kind of noise but it'll be doing that. And that's how you rewind a bobbin. So and it perfect. works really well. Yeah, perfectly possible, Lorraine. Yeah. I'm sorry if I missed it. I'm going, no, no, don't, you don't have to apologise if I missed it. But I just, I think that explanation was, it was a good question because mm. what I... What cooking, Lorraine? Uh, yeah. Lorraine, Lorraine looks like, from a post we see, like, this looks like she's a serious cook. Yes. <laughs> now, a couple of other things. Tower gauges. I'm going to mention tower gauges. Tower gauges, for those of you who don't know. What is this? This is a way of getting a measurement. There's a little uh, series of, of measurement numbers down here between zero and 400 on that left-hand side. And what that does is it gives us for this bobbin and bobbin case, if we put it through this tower gauge, it gives us 
a measurement for what that tension is. And if we need to adjust it, we can adjust the spring without removing it just on the side here. So the idea is that, if I'll just show you how you put this in actually. So feed up your bobbin and put it into the bobbin case as you would normally do. So it goes clockwise, clockwise. I normally hold the bobbin case so that the little slot is at the 12 o'clock position and it comes off clockwise through the slot under the spring, just like so. Then we're gonna put it into the tower gauge. The way it goes in is at the 12 o'clock position is that little thing there, like that. And it clicks in just like it would if it was going into your machine. And then you put it around these two little white Teflon discs and then pull. And do you see how that is producing a number about 160, if I pull it fairly fast. Initially it goes, but it's the consistency. It's the 160 sort of level. If that were um, a number that was correct, I could leave it as it is, but if it felt too loose or too tight, I can reduce or increase the tension on the side here. So if I want to increase, I'll go to the clockwise, and that's now at 240. So the way to get what the right number is is to initially test it out and then for each of these bobbins that you've got you might want to make a note that for deco bob it's 160 or 170. Um, it, it's not an essential piece of kit some of our customers have it and some of yeah. them uh, don't it's perfectly possible to get your tension right always with your own standard tests um, but some people like it's a little the consistency cutter. of the tower gauge yeah, I think when we first started doing um, the handy quilters, the tower gauge was available and quite a few people bought it. And they found that just by the feel, as Pete said, by doing that drop test, they didn't really use it. So I would say that it's something that you definitely don't, don't have to have. Um, when you come to our classes, uh, well, you can try this. I do mention it on the classes and people can have a go. But it's not an essential piece of kit. One of our engineers, Paul, really loves it, and he sets up all, all of his bobbin cases that way. Um, he, he, you know, he comes from an engineering background, so he really relates to that, that as a tool. But other people won't, and they'll just do it from feel. So you know, it's something that, as I say, if you, if you come to a class here um, and you're interested in it, then maybe have a go and see whether it's something you might want to invest in. They're not inexpensive, so that's why we don't really we don't feel like it's a necessary piece of kit, but it's important to know what's available. So Lorraine is cooking beef cheeks in red wine. <gasps> oh, we'll be over. Low and slow, Lorraine, low and slow. <laughs> um, and Derek rightly says that Lorraine is an excellent cook and an excellent quilter, me. which is also true. Oh, that is true. Lorraine oh. is one of those people actually who is excellent at whatever she decides to put her mind Application. to. Application, yes. yeah. Right, um, Linda, why does a bobbin wind spongy? Oh, Derek's already re replied to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so probably because the tension on the oh, yeah. bobbin winder has been too set too low, or you haven't had the thread corrected through the tension discs on the bobbin winder. Yeah. Watch the video because on um, in the instruction manual for this handy quilter bobbin winder, they they generally take the thread from here and go around this way and to the bobbin. But we recommend coming down this side and going back over the top. And what that does is it ensures it goes in, well, it doesn't ensure, but there's a better chance of it going in the tension disc and not popping out. If your tension discs are tied, are tightened down too much and the thread can't, really just can't get in to the tension disc, then you might find it just sort of hovers around the outside and it's just very loose when it winds onto the bobbin. So if you've got any issues with winding a bobbin, look at this, tension assembly it's just the same as what's on your machine so you know how to do that so it's just the same have a look at it the bobbin tree bobbin tree is this cute little thing we've only got a few of these um, in stock it's 21 pounds and it's uh, a way of holding both domestic and the m size bobbins it's a cute little thing so i just thought i'd just mention that because it was a new product uh, last year the 
other thing I wanted to mention, we had, and I'm not going to mention any, anybody's name here, but from time to time, we have had needles uh, fall down into the bobbin assembly and the tip breaks off and breaks into the hook assembly and gets jammed. I might even post a, actually a photo because I posted it on the, uh, the engineer's Facebook page a couple of weeks ago when, when one came in. And the, one of the reasons why the needle can fall out is that people haven't tightened the little nut on the side of the needle clamp assembly. The old style machines had a little black thing a little black, black furled thumb screw. That's a better word than, set of words than thing. And that black furled thumb screw was not always easy to tighten. For those of us, myself included, who've got arthritic joints that don't work very well. And that has been replaced on all the new machines with a silver one that's got a little hex key in the middle of it hex key hole in the middle of it. And the reason being is that we can then tighten, that's probably not the best one to use, um, but it's the only one I've got. Uh, so you can actually tighten that. Once you've got it thumb tight, you can actually put your little hex key. You won't have one like this, but you'll have a little L-shaped hex key or a handy quilter one, and you'll just tighten that uh, needle clamp screw until it is really nice and tight because on the movable machines, the vibration of the machine can cause that to become loose and drop out. And we know um, from experience that that is bad for the machine. Really so I very highly recommend it. If you have an older machine with one of the black thumb screws, replace it. They're yep. very inexpensive. We've got them for sale on our website. They are. I think they're five pounds. Five I think. pounds. Yeah. Um, and it'll save you a world of pain if totally. your needle does drop out. Yeah, absolutely. And now when we do a service, if we see one, we tend to just say to people, we, we've replaced it because it's just too expensive to, to have a machine back because it's dropped out. I think, I think that is everything on there, but and it's now 50 minutes, but I just wanted to cover just the start of this and just to mention how this um, comes off. What we recommend is every few months, maybe every quarter if you're using glide thread, you need to take off your stitch place um, and just clean out underneath it. So with a, a little flat, you can use a long one. You don't have to have a short one. The long one just sticks out the side. But this is what we would do um, every few months. And if you're using a very linty thread, you will want to do this more regularly. So remove the two little screws there. Have a look at the underside. You'll see this might look like it's got a little felt pad underneath it if you've been using very, very linty thread. Um, that is not part of the machine. You need to get rid of that. And you'll find that the, look at that, the little bits of, lint thread and everything. If you do get a thread jam and you get a, a, a error message come up that says something like needle sensor failure during walk, which sounds a bit of a weird message, got to be frank, but what it means is that this can't move up and down and it means that that's probably because that can't rotate. There could be another reason for it. So that's one of the reasons, but if you're able to do this and it still comes up with it, then the chances are is that you've got a little bit of thread from your thread jam and it's causing the needle to not be able to go up and down properly when the motor is running. And would you say, is that a good description, Pete? Or do you yeah, want to add so something to that? This is just turning the handle then. So if you do get that message, yeah. it usually means that there's some thread stopping the bobbing in uh, here hook assembly from turning yeah so by turning the hand wheel manually just very slowly you can tell if there's uh, a point at which it gets very tight and that probably confirms that there is some thread in there by taking off the needle plate you can usually clean that out and solve the problem straight away if it doesn't solve it you may need to contact us and we can go through some other options yeah abs absolutely and i just wanted to show you that with this, I've got a little a hook here. So this bit here, this is it off the shaft. So what's happening is in here, there is a shaft running into the back of this. 
and this is turning the assembly, but it won't turn both parts of the assembly. There's a center bit. In this case, to make it easier, I've picked a black one, which is metal, but it's, it's actually the inside here is a different part to that that's going to rotate. Okay, so this is held in place with a, what's called a little stop finger. That just sort of stops that moving. And this is how your machine rotates. On the blog post, I've got a lovely little GIF I found for you that shows you how a stitch is formed. And you will recognize this part in the video. And I think it's just a useful thing to know is how a stitch is formed. It will help your understanding of if you've got problems, why it isn't working. So this is the hook here. This is the very sharp little hook. And if you hit something or break a needle, very occasionally it is possible to just uh, damage that. Um, it can be slightly filed, lightly filed, but we wouldn't recommend anybody else does that. If you get a bird's nest, in here, in this black bit here, what Pete was saying about rotating the hand wheel, there are little cutters in here. They're just here on this black one. It's not that easy to see. Um, but they are just here. And what happens is if you've got a thread jam and you can't even get your quilt to move to the side, it might be because those threads have just built up and built up and built up. You probably didn't have the tension discs quite engaged and the top thread was just throwing thread onto the bottom. Come to the back where the hand wheel is. Don't forget you've got a hand wheel because some people don't even realize they've got a hand wheel. It's the same as any domestic machine. You've got a hand wheel here and the normal direction of movement is to rotate it towards you from this side of the machine. So I'm going to rotate it and just go backwards and forwards. And what that's going to do is it's going to activate those cutters and suddenly miracle of all miracles, you can now move your quilt. And that's because of the cutters. Same is true of your domestic machine. It will also have cutters. And that's why you suddenly find that you can remove the culprit, the quilt and the thread from your machine, clean it all out, take off the stitch plate, get rid of all the bits of thread. And if you have any issues, it's probably because there's a bit of thread left in there and just take it out again. If it's still not working, then you might need to give us a call. Every single bobbin change then I'm taking out my empty bobbin and I am cleaning in this assembly. If I've got a machine such as the Avanti, uh, sorry, the Amara, the Infinity, the Forte, there will be a stopper at the back here to stop any dust and fluff and all the rest of it getting into the body of the, the machine in here. If you have one of those types of machine, that's sealed, but not an Avanti or a Sweet 16, then you can use compressed air, canned air. And in fact, the new Moxie has the new Moxie. that battle as well. So you can use canned air on the Moxie also. Yeah, see there's if bits of fluff in there. So we just keep that nice and clean and then a drop of oil just to lubricate it at the bottom of this assembly, this hook assembly here. Where those two metal parts come together, I'm just gonna put a dot of oil, every single bobbin change, and she's good to go. So that is, I think, pretty much everything. Don't forget we've got the um, offer on that because that I think is going to be, if you've never used the Deco Bobs, that's a really good one that we've put together. We might keep it going and maybe do different collections in due course. But I'm going to suggest that you all, you know, watch this, um, watch the blog post videos that we've got on there. Just kind of, you know, a bit of education really for you on more about your bobbin and your bobbin case is, is only to the good. So I hope that it's been interesting um, and that you've learned something. Uh, it's been lovely to connect with you today here on a Saturday, chilly Saturday. It's due to feel like minus, no more than minus four all day today here. So um, definitely a day for the log burner, staying in and wrapping up warm and maybe making some quilts. So have a lovely weekend, everybody. Post any comments down below. It's always good to get more of your questions that we can then respond to because that helps everybody else who's looking on here as well. And remember, no question is a silly question. So goodbye from me and goodbye from... Goodbye from me too. Yeah. Have a great time. Bye. Bye.